Hello, everybody. My name is Graham Elwood, and you are watching Boom, the Political Vigilante. Well, a great way to support the show is do what Tim Stack has done and go to patreon.com slash Graham Elwood, where you can submit articles like this. I wanted to talk about this because we just had the Nicaragua election. And so uh, the Facebook team that tried to swing Nicaragua's election is full of U.S. spies. Well, that's shocking. Usually social media is just for the people. And everyone in Silicon Valley, they're just they're just fun-loving hipsters. They right, they wear skateboard shoes, right? Right? Mm, we've studied this over and over. <laughs> a tacit agreement between the government and Facebook appears to have been made. You can keep the profits, but we control the message. As such, a cynic might wonder what functional difference there is between Facebook and the national security state. This was in Mint Press News. I'm going to just go over this real quick. We're going to Ben wave uh, way in to, to unpack this for us, right? So less than a week before Nicaragua's presidential election, social media giant Facebook deleted the accounts of hundreds of the country's top news outlets, journalists, and activists. Boy, that's never happened. All of them supported the ruling left-wing Sandinista government, a top Washington target for regime change. Boy, have we ever heard this story before? There's a left-wing government that wants to empower the people. They're not going to give up their land and their resources to American corporations. So the State Department comes in and says, oh, no, your problems, your terrorists, it's bad, it's bad, it's bad. Like, we've, if you ever watch Government Secrets with Lee Camp and myself, you know that this, like, we've, the, you, this is the playbook. This is the playbook. And every time it's always like, the socialists got to power. Oh, they're terrorists, they're communists, they're beating their own people, whatever the lie is always pushed, right? So that's what they uncovered in Mint Press News, of course. This is a quote. This is appalling interference by Facebook in particular, which is the most popular social media outlet in Nicaragua. They uh, allege that, there's, that they've stopped a government-deployed troll farm, but what they have actually done is to close accounts of ordinary Sandinista activists, particularly young people, often with many followers. So we know we've had Susie Dawson on the show. We know this is what they do. Activists that can get the message out, people with big followings, they're targeted. I've been targeted, right? Other people that we know have been targeted, Lee Camp, Jimmy, they, well, we've all been targeted because that's what happens when you start getting regular people involved and you can't do anything that goes against the State Department. So the propaganda arm keeps going. Now, this, is, this was in CNN, right? Ortega wins in Nicaragua elections panned as parody by international observers. Who are these international observers? They all, I'm sure, part of the five eyes, I'm sure. So I'm kind of familiar with what's been going on in Nicaragua, but I wanted to bring on uh, Ben Norton to the show. He's never been on the show before, but he is uh, really can shed some light on the specifics of how, once again, America really hates democracy. Like we really hate it. Let's be clear. We hate democracy. When corporations win, then it's okay. But when the people, nope. So here he is, for, uh, who's done a lot of reporting on this, uh, I believe on the gray zone and other outlets, ladies and gentlemen, Ben Norton. Hey, thanks for having me. It's good to be here, Graham. First time, uh, first time on the show. Yeah, I really appreciate you. Uh, you know, uh, I know you're busy. Um, you're doing you're doing the whole you know the the, the indie left inter interview circuit as it is. Uh, <laughs> but I really wanted for you to um, shed light on on basically give everybody who's anyone who's watching who maybe hasn't been paying as much attention to what how this has played out and what this election means to the United States and why they're so against um the sandinistas well you hit the nail on the head where if you look at washington's foreign policy for well over 100 years now it's clear there's a there's a, a central theme we don't care about democracy all we actually care about is more and more profits control of natural resources control of geostrategic locations so we can have trade and dominate tr international trade and make more money and we've seen this again and again especially in latin america in the 1820s, this is 200 years ago, the U.S. government declared the Monroe Doctrine, which basically said that Latin America belongs to the U.S. empire. No other powers should intervene in Latin America because it's ours. It's our backyard, proverbially. So this policy that we've seen against Nicaragua is far from new. If anyone knows anything about Nicaragua and the U.S., they probably remember vaguely that in the 1980s, the CIA armed and trained these far-right death squads called the Contras. This was the Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan administration. 
We know that the CIA was, was training them, giving them weapons. And one of the former leaders of the Contras wrote an article in the New York Times in which he admitted, it was like a big tell-all, he admitted, he said, terrorism is the most effective weapon of the CIA-backed Contras. It's an exact quote. And he said, this is another exact quote. He wrote that the Contras burn down schools and hospitals faster than the Sandinistas can build them. So who are the Sandinistas? In 1979, there was a socialist revolution in Nicaragua led by the Sandinista National Liberation Front. The Sandinistas are a leftist group, but they're also kind of unique. They, they also have elements of liberation theology of like a progressive form of Christianity. They're, they're you know, not, not all revolutionary movements around the world are the same. They're, they're very unique. But what does tie them together, unlike other, I mean, in addition to other leftist movements, there's one common thread, of course. They have universal education, free health care at all levels. They have housing programs, jobs programs, all of these social programs. Really, the short of it is that the government uses the money that they have to actually help people, to help poor people, to fight poverty, to provide education and health care, and to foreign corporations and to the U.S. government. That's a threat. That's the threat of a good example because... If a poor country like Nicaragua, which is the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere after Haiti, if they can provide free health care and education at all levels, then why can't the richest country in the world or now the second richest because China just overtook the U.S.? So the U.S. has been meddling in Nicaragua for many decades, just as, you know, the U.S. has been trying to crush the Cuban Revolution ever since that succeeded in 1959. And the U.S. is trying to crush Venezuela. And the U.S. backed a military coup in Bolivia two years ago. In November of 2019, it was a blatantly far-right military coup against the elected president, Evo Morales. And what was his crime? Again, it was being a socialist. So this is, this is the common theme. Now, for the elections we, that we saw most recently, of course, the, the so-called threat is that the Sandinistas are the most popular party, the Sandinista Front. And it's not a surprise why. Now, there's a lot of propaganda saying that the Sandinistas are, are th the reason that they're still in power is because they oppress the opposition and they control everything. It's, it's right. ridiculous. I'm in Nicaragua. I actually live here. And, and I was an electoral observer. I've been here a long time. I understand how it works. No, the reason they're the most popular party by far is because of all the things I just named. They're the only party in the history of this country that has provided health care and education and housing and jobs. They've delivered it. They've actually done it. Whereas in the U.S., you know, sometimes some Democrats will say, oh, well, we want health care and education, but they never deliver it. And many of them don't even pretend like they want universal health care. We've seen how many Democrats, the leaders of the Democratic Party, have gone against Medicare for all and against, you know, universal oh. higher education. So yeah, that's I mean, why I'll, the Sandinistas are popular. And the so-called threat is that they are still in power and they won the elections. Yeah. And I, I mean, just to interject to specific to the Republicans and Democrats, you know, I, I, I just did a video for Straight Arrow News. And if you go to Open Secrets, you can see the healthcare lobby, the big pharmaceutical companies donate pretty evenly, almost down the line. Sometimes it's, you know, 4951, 4852 to the both parties. Like they just like, so then we, we, we maybe we'll get some lip service on we're going to fight for Medicare for all. And oh, they can't seem to figure it out when the bill is coming. So it's like, it, it's, it's, it's so hilarious to me that these these so-called poor countries are viewed as just this like, oh, it's just anarchy. They don't have anything. And thank God we're here in America where you can, you know, file for bankruptcy for medical debt or just die because you're turned down because you don't have health insurance. And then all oh, these evil Sandinista, the social, I mean, just about every country, you name several of them. But I mean, like literally, but we could, you know. Uh, Venezuela. I mean, honestly, uh, Chavez did similar stuff. I mean, they always help the people. And then it's like, nope, we got to get them out of there. We'll call them whatever we got to call them. So I just wanted to interject that, but I'm sorry, go ahead in terms of why. So you just outlined why the Sandinistas are so popular. Shocking. They get stuff for the people and not the, the oligarchs. That's who knew who, wow. Who, who saw all that coming? Yeah, absolutely. And this is, this is a crusade, really. The U S since the 1980s, has been obsessed with trying to destroy the Sandinista revolution. And in 1990, they briefly succeeded. And it, what's incredible is there's all these narratives that the Sandinistas are authoritarian and all this. But in 1990, there was a democratic election and the Sandinistas lost. 
And it was totally unfair, of course. I mentioned that, that in the 1980s, the U.S. government, the CIA was supporting these far-right death squads, the Contras, who were killing, killing people. They killed tens of thousands of people. They terrorized the country. They blew up bridges and roads. Also, there was a U.S. blockade, just like the U.S. blockade of Cuba and the U.S. blockade of Venezuela. So anytime a, a left-wing government comes to power and they nationalize their oil, like in Venezuela, and mm -hmm. they kick out the foreign corporations, then the U.S. suffocates them with sanctions. And then just as like a little kid will like hit you and then say, why are you hitting yourself? will hit you with your arm and be like, why are you hitting yourself? Why are you hitting yourself? That's what the U.S. does economically at a geopolitical level. It suffocates countries economically, and then it refuses to recognize the elections until the right wing wins. And in 1990, the right wing, funded by the U.S. government with their campaign created by the CIA, they won the election. And the so-called authoritarian Sandinistas, they said, OK, we lost the election. We're going to leave power, which is the first time actually in history, at least modern history, where a revolutionary movement that took power through an armed struggle against a U.S.-backed dictatorship, they lost in an election and they voluntarily gave up power. That had never happened before. But we're supposed to believe the Sandinistas are so authoritarian. So for 16 years, actually for 17 years, from 1990 until 2007, there were multiple right-wing neoliberal governments in Nicaragua. They privatized all the, all the social programs. They privatized education, privatized healthcare, privatized the water grid, privatized the electrical grid. They sold off the railroads to U.S. companies. They, they, they did all of the Washington consensus, the neoliberal economics that we're told are, is for efficiency and all this. And the country became even poorer. The economy didn't grow. There were fewer jobs, unemployment increased, inequality skyrocketed. There was more violence and drug trafficking and all of this. Surprise. And then in 2006, the Sandinistas came back to power through democratic elections. They won the 2006 elections and they came back to power in 2007. And they've continued winning the elections ever since. And the U.S. has been desperate to try to overthrow them. And, you know, people ask why all the time. Well, think about what they did in the U.S. Look what, look what they did to Bernie Sanders, who wasn't even like that radical. I mean, he was a, he says in Europe, he would be considered a center or center left candidate. Right. But look at, look at how the extreme measures that the U S oligarchy went to the media outlets, the DNC leadership, they went to such an extreme degree that they, they went to so many extreme levels to try to rig the election against Bernie Sanders. They successfully did so two times. And so imagine what they do abroad. That was internally in the in the U.S.'s own politics. I mean, we have to understand that the U.S. is an oligarchy. There's nothing resembling democracy in the U.S. You have two factions of the same oligarchic capitalist party that agrees on all the same politics, all the same policies. There's a 5% difference on cultural issues. But when it comes to economic issues and political issues and foreign policy, it's all the same. And so uh, abroad... They enforced those same policies and they used the military to do it in the case of Iraq, in the case of Syria, in the case of Libya. Libya had been the most prosperous country in Africa, and now it's a failed state with open air slave markets. And then if they can't do it militarily, they do it through the CIA. They do it through funding so-called nonprofit organizations. They do it through funding extreme right wing media propaganda, and they do it through meddling in in so many other countless ways sanctions cyber attacks i mean it's it's hybrid warfare is what it's called and unfortunately the u.s is continuing to wage hybrid warfare against tons of countries all around the world i mean i could we could spend the entire time just naming the list of the countries being targeted for with foreign meddling which is way worse than anything that russia was even accused of in russiagate which was like facebook memes yeah yeah, it's, 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 yeah, they spent a hundred grand or some ooh, like a uh, big whopping number like that. I saw one guy from Google in front of Congress and they asked how many ads, how much money was spent on Google ads to try to sway the election. He said $2,500 and he said that in front of Congress. And I was like, wow, boy, I mean, you know, a $1.5 billion that Hillary had, that's no match for 2,500 bucks. I mean, that's like, oh my God, that's like a a big mortgage payment for one month or something. That's nuts. Um, so I, I wanted to, to um, and obviously, uh, yeah, all, all of the ways the United States empire is just 
crucifying anybody that wants democracy. And yet we claim we want democracy and then we destabilize countries. So they become chaotic. And then we go, Oh, we, we had no choice. We got to send our military in or whatever, just to justify more military spending. But and what then, as Trump said, we have to keep the oil. He just <laughs> openly admitted it. The U S yeah. has troops in Syria and Trump was like, we're leaving them there to take the oil. And they're still yeah. there with Biden, by the way. And they're still taking the oil. Of course. Because there's very little difference, like, as you pointed out, between both parties. There's like a 5% difference in cultural issues. The one party gets a lot of money from, you know, the Republicans get money from the NRA. The Democrats get money from APAC. You know, that's about, you know, uh, abortion, gun control, even gun control is lip service by the Democrats. They don't really give a shit. I mean, if they really, Obama could have done it when he had power. The Democrats could have done it. It's That's all even just talk. That's just this football that they want to kick back and forth on the corporate media. But so what specifically just happened um, with this election? Ortega won, right? So the Sandinistas are still in power. And what has been the leading up to that? And what is the reaction? I mean, you're there, like on the streets. What, what Leading up to the election and the reaction afterwards, what is the difference between there, what you're seeing and hearing in the, in the press in Nicaragua versus what, like I just showed that CNN ridiculous article or whatever? Yeah, so... Polls consistently over many months, this is not new, polls have consistently shown that the government, which is led by President Ortega and he himself, they have support that fluctuates between like 60 and 70 percent. So about two thirds of the population, which is pretty good. I mean, especially for the region. Look at Biden's polls. I mean, it's, it's there, there are people who are opposed to the government and there are opposition forces, but they're a minority. Right. So. The government is quite popular, in, in, especially in the context of Latin America. And there are a few talking points used to try to discredit the government. Now, one of the talking points that is true, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's undemocratic, is that Ortega has been in power since 2007 and that this is his, this is his fourth term. And it's probably going to be his last term. He's pretty old and it's very likely this will be his final term. So he still hasn't been in power as long as Angela Merkel in Germany, by the way. But... <laughs> He's called a dictator because he's in his fourth term. Now, this was the same talking point used to, well, his fourth term begins in January. This is the same talking point that was used to demonize Evo Morales, the socialist president in Bolivia, who again was democratically elected. And in 2019, in the October elections, he freely and fairly won the election. But there was this claim that he's a dictator because he's entering his fourth term. Now, whatever, you can criticize governments for that, but the reality is that if you have a very popular leader and they, they are effective and competent and people like them, then it, you can say that actually in some ways term limits are kind of undemocratic. And there's a lot of liberals in the U.S. who obsess over Obama. They worship Obama and they would love him to have a third and a fourth term. They joke about it all the time. But if you actually have a popular left-wing leader who wins the elections again and again, then, I mean... I don't see any problem with having a fourth term if he's actually still popular. Of course, that was used to justify the coup in Bolivia in 2019. What's not that well known, because the coup in Bolivia succeeded, it's well known. But the year before, there was a trial run for the coup in Bolivia here in Nicaragua in 2018. There was a very violent coup attempt with tons of millions of dollars in U.S. government funding to these very violent right-wing elements that tried to overthrow the government here in Nicaragua. And by the way, in 2017, the year before that, there was another very violent coup attempt in Venezuela against the elected socialist government there. So like I said, if you have a socialist government that comes to power, even if it's through democratic elections, the US will spend millions of dollars funding these extremist groups. And if they can't win the elections, as we saw this past week in Venezuela, then the U.S. tries to discredit the elections. So, and then, it, it, and then, in addition, they try a violent coup attempt. Now, the coup attempt in Nicaragua failed after 2018. It did succeed in 2019 in Bolivia, and in now going forward, after the coup attempt, the, the Nicaraguan government arrested some of the coup leaders because, shocker, in Nicaragua, it's illegal to take millions of dollars from a foreign government and organize a coup attempt, a violent coup attempt. That's illegal pretty much in every country in the world last time I checked. It's definitely illegal in the US. So in Nicaragua, there were people who were involved in the coup attempt who were arrested and they were charged with money laundering because we have documents showing that they, they took millions of dollars from the US government 
to these organizations. And then much of that money went into their bank accounts, which is uh, money laundering and others charged with, you know, violence and coup plotting and all of this. So there was this narrative. I mean, these people were all funded by the U.S. government. So the U.S. government started this narrative that Ortega was imprisoning all of his all of the presidential hopefuls, all of his so-called opponents. Now, there were opposition figures who participated in the elections. They weren't the people who organized the coup attempt, but there were candidates. And I've published in my reporting, I published a 10-minute video, like a short documentary about the elections. I published an article, and anyone can go to the gray zone and check out the photo of the ballot. I took photos of the ballot. There were six options on the ballot. Five of the options were right-wing parties. One of the options was the party of President Ortega, the Sandinista Front. So there were five other op opposition candidates that were on the ballot. They participated in the vote. They won hundreds of thousands of votes in the election. But the narrative was that because the coup leaders funded by the U.S. government were arrested, that supposedly the election was illegitimate because he supposedly arrested presidential hopefuls, which doesn't mean anything. I mean, I often point out Kanye West is a presidential hopeful. I mean, you could say that we are presidential hopefuls. If you, Graham, if you want to be president one day, you're a presidential hopeful. So if you take millions of dollars from Russia to organize a violent coup attempt in the U.S. and you're arrested, then you could just say, oh, I'm a presidential hopeful and the U.S. is, is, is politically persecuting me. I'm a political prisoner because I want to be president someday. So that's the narrative used to try to discredit the elections in Nicaragua. Wow. I mean, it's like, and, and <laughs> boy, we, we will really do every tactic possible that, that we can to do this. So now that, so Ortega's won, he's going to start, you said his, I think his fourth term in January. What, and they tried and failed. So what do you, what do you see the, the CIA and the U S state department? What do you, what do you think they're going to try to do next? Well, it's, it's the same playbook used in Venezuela. I mean, so much of what's going on in Nicaragua is play by play the exact same blueprint that the U.S. used against Venezuela. So in Venezuela, Hugo Chavez launched the Bolivarian Revolution. He came to power through democratic elections in 1998 and came to power. And then he won election after election because he was extremely popular. Because, again, surprise, if you're the only leader in, your, in the modern history of your country that, that uses the tax dollars to actually create healthcare and education and housing and job programs and all of the social programs, you're going to be popular. So Chavez was very popular. He declared the Bolivarian revolution. He started denouncing U S meddling and U S imperialism. He gave this incredible speech at the United nations right after George Bush. And he went up on the stage and he said, smells like sulfur. And then he said, he said, George Bush is literally Satan in his speech. I mean, he just went off and all of this. He, he denounced the Iraq war. So you have these very charismatic, popular leaders that denounce the U.S. and the international stage. And of course, Washington gets really angry. So there, were, there was a coup against Hugo Chavez in Venezuela in 2002. Again, this is the democratically elected president. There was a su briefly successful military coup against him. We now have all the documents showing that the George Bush administration was deeply involved in supporting this coup. And they overthrew Chavez for a few days. And they replaced him immediately with a right-wing uh, multimillionaire oligarch named Pedro Carmona, who immediately tried to privatize the oil. Like in, in like two days, he tried to privatize the oil. And Chavez was so popular that the people of Venezuela went out into the streets and they overthrew the coup regime. And Chavez came back to power, the democratically elected left-wing leftist president, socialist president. So he was in power and, and then he died in 2013 in very shady circumstances, I should say. And then there was another election right after he died in 2013. And Nicolas Maduro, who was his vice president, won those elections. And since then, Maduro has won presidential elections, 2013 and 2018. And the U.S. has tried all these coup attempts. They failed. So the violent coup attempts have failed. So, and the, the, the right-wing opposition can't win at the ballot box fairly. So then the U.S. imposed sanctions. More and more sanctions, sanctions, sanctions. This began with Obama. Like many of these policies, it's bipartisan. The sanctions against Venezuela began with Obama. And then when Trump came in, it, by the way, in 2015, Obama declared Venezuela a, quote, extraordinary threat to the national security wow. of the United States, which is incredible. Like, like Venezuela is going to bomb the U.S.? It's absurd. Yeah. 
But that was the justification used to impose more and more sanctions. And then Trump came in in 2017. He skyrocketed the sanctions and he imposed a full on economic embargo, which is a Cuba style blockade of Venezuela. So suffocating the country, preventing this country that relies on oil exports from exporting its oil, preventing people from from buying foreign technology, buying medicine, even buying food. So it's, it's trying to suffocate the country. And this strategy is not new. If people know about CIA operations in 1970, the people of Chile voted, a dem they, there was a democratic election and they voted in a socialist president named Salvador Allende. And he was the first example of a democratically elected socialist president coming to power. And immediately the Richard Nixon administration, along with war criminal Henry Kissinger, who, who was almost 100 years old, he'll never die. He's like, he's, he like made a pact with Satan or something. But Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon, we have recordings of them saying that right after Allende was elected, freely and fairly in Chile, Richard Nixon said in a, in a recording, he said, quote, make the economy scream. Make the economy scream. That is still the strategy of the U.S. The U.S. imposed a blockade of Chile in 1970, preventing Chile from selling its copper because the Anaconda, the Anaconda Corporation wanted to get access to Chile's copper. Chile has one of the largest copper reserves in the world. And it's the same thing in Venezuela. And now here in, Ven in Nicaragua, it's the same playbook. The violent coup attempts failed. The right-wing opposition can't win fairly at the ballot box. So now it's economic warfare, make the economy scream. And three days before the election it, here in Nicaragua, November 7th, on November 4th, the U.S. Congress passed the so-called Renacer Act, which is sanctions, more and more sanctions on Nicaragua. Three days after the election, Biden signed into law the Renacer Act and, and immediately imposed more sanctions on Nicaragua. And, and talk about election meddling, by the way threatening the people of Nicaragua and saying, if you vote for the Sandinistas again, we are going to impose sanctions on you. That's what the U.S. Congress did three days before the election. And then three days after the election, they did it. They imposed sanctions. So that, that's the playbook. It's to try to make the economy scream, to try to make people suffer by imposing an economic blockade on the country. Are, are you feeling any of these sanctions just on a day-to-day -day level uh, living there? Well, yes and no. The sanctions on Nicaragua are not new. I mentioned that there was a coup attempt, a violent coup attempt in 2018, and it failed. And so in the, toward the end of 2018, the U.S. Congress, with bipartisan support, of course, passed something called the NICA Act, which, you know, I often point out the, the NICA Act, the A in NICA, N-I-C-A, already means act. So like the geniuses in Congress wrote a law called NIC Act Act twice. But anyway... The, the, the Cuba, the anti-Cuban, uh, anti-Nicaragua, anti-Venezuela lobby in Miami, a lot of those people are not very smart, as we see with Marco Rubio. So they, they passed this law in 2018 called the NICA Act, which was sanctions on Nicaragua. And then they sanctioned over the past three years, they, they have sanctioned more and more state institutions. They sanctioned the military. They sanctioned the police. They san sanctioned certain banks. And they've sanctioned a lot of government officials. This, this past week, two weeks ago, right after the election, the U.S. government sanctioned top officials, and they also sanctioned the prosecutor's office, like the judicial branch. So every few months, they impose more and more sanctions. So yes, there are people are starting to feel some economic difficulties, and of course, there's inflation, but right now, there's also a lot of inflation around the world. But another thing that should, we should keep in mind is that one of the reasons the sanctions against Venezuela have been so devastating which is it's different in other countries, is that Venezuela is a petro state. And Venezuela has been a petro state for over 100 years. Yep. Ever since oil was discovered 100 years ago in Venezuela, the country, the government has relied on oil revenue for the vast majority of the government revenue. I mean, there are taxes, but this is a poor country. So the majority of the revenue comes from, ta from oil. And before the, the Bolivarian Revolution launched by Hugo Chavez, before all of the oil revenue just went into the pockets of the elites, of the oligarchy, right? But Chavez said, no, we're going to use the oil money to help poor people, to create education and housing and, and health care. So in, when, the, when the U.S. started imposing sanctions on Venezuela, and especially after the U.S. made a deal with Saudi Arabia to massively overpump oil, to overproduce oil, which 
flooded the market with too much oil, which dropped the price of oil in the global market, which hurt the economy of Russia, Iran, and Venezuela, the, the main adversaries of the US, right? So ever since the US flooded the market with Saudi oil, plummeting the price of oil, this was in the, this was a, uh, this was in the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. And then the, then the US imposed sanctions on Venezuela. So the Venezuelan economy has been really devastated. A UN expert, the UN Special Rapporteur on sanctions, recently wrote a report. Again, this is an independent, you know, totally impartial, not non-biased UN expert. And I'm not being sarcastic. It's truly a non-biased UN expert. Mm -hmm. She wrote this report, and she said that because of the U.S. sanctions, the Venezuelan government has lost 99% of its government revenue. Government revenue. Wow. That's why the Venezuelan economy is in such shambles. It's not because of socialism. It's, I mean, Venezuela had a socialist government from 1998 until the sanctions were imposed in 2015. And it was actually one of the fastest growing economies in Latin America. It was a model for Latin America. It, poverty, sky, uh, poverty plummeted. Poverty was cut by, by two thirds. I mean, it was, it was actually a model. But with the, with the plummeting prices of oil and with the US sanctions, the Venezuelan economy was starved. The government was starved of 99% of its revenue, and, and the economy went in, into free fall. I mean, it, it's very difficult. I've been to Venezuela numerous times, but the government has been tries, tried to do what it can, providing food, providing health care, providing education to people. It's, it's hard, but they have their basic needs met. Now, the difference in Venezuela and Nicaragua is that Nicaragua doesn't have oil. It does have gas, by the way. And the U.S. is imposing sanctions on the the state-owned gas mm. that, that is trying to sell gas. So that's going to hurt the economy. But Nicaragua is a largely agricultural economy. It doesn't rely on, on oil exports. And it produces the majority of its food. It produces over 95% of its food. So the mm. strategy going forward is to try to make the economy scream. And there are definitely economic difficulties. But... Nicaragua learned from the 1980s when it was under blockade by the U.S., and it learned from Venezuela. So it, more and more around the world, the U.S. tries to impose more and more sanctions, and it does hurt, but more and more countries around the world are trying to find new ways of doing business, excluding the U.S., excluding the U.S. dollar. So yes, sanctions do a lot of damage, but the more and more the U.S. uses this weapon of sanctions, the weaker it gets. And as in the years to come, Russia and China, and you know, this is a huge concern of, the, of Washington. They're always like, the Russians and the Chinese, they're not allowed to do any business in Latin America. Latin America belongs to us. Well, Russia and China are working closely with countries in Latin America, like Venezuela, like Cuba, like Nicaragua. And they're trying to build new alternatives that, that will prevent the sanctions from doing damage. So the more and more the US attacks, the more and more, ironically, it actually weakens the weapons of economic warfare it has. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Graham Elwood. I am here with Ben Norton. Please hit the like button, share, subscribe. We are just talking about the sanctions that have been put on by uh, the United States Empire against Nicaragua. Um, and we were just discussing... How uh, and and I think this is this is this is getting interesting because the United States, is, as we've just been talking about, has this very standard playbook, and one of the ways they do is the economic sanctions to to make destabilize economies. So then it seems like oh, this country's up for grabs, and the, look what this look what happens under socialism. It's always chaos. Not let's. I guess we're just going to forget about the last year and a half where we've had empty shelves. There's a supply chain issue. The Long Beach Harbor is just stacked up full because capitalism and globalization is so great. Uh, <laughs> we can't get certain products. We just have it. We just this last year and a half. I was always told that only happened in socialist countries, but the biggest capitalist country ever was like, I know we don't have it. We're out. I don't know what to do. Um, so one of the things I've seen is that I'm a huge, I'm a huge, I don't know where you are on, on Bitcoin or crypto in general, but like El Salvador, when they decided to go Bitcoin to make that a requirement of their currency, now they can accept US dollars or whatever, but every business has to accept Bitcoin, which is a big deal. And other countries, I've read some articles and I've done some videos on it for my show, are starting to wake up to that, like, wait a minute, Bitcoin, crypto in general, but Bitcoin specifically could be a way to circumvent 
this equity, which sanctions, which are an act of warfare, by the way, um, as I'm sure you're aware, but for the audience, it's an act, what the, what America does is an act of warfare financially in all these ways. So and it's is illegal there, under international law. It's totally illegal. Not that oh, the U S cares about international law. No, not at all. God, we, we're, we're like the original star Trek where they were just like, Kirk would just blow away the prime directive and just interact with people and try to get laid. And then well, what about the prime directive? Ah, you know, there was hot chicks on that planet or whatever. So that's how America is with the international law. We, we don't follow it at all. We bring it out when there's some country that isn't giving up its resources. And we want to say they violated international law. Like it's, it's just a bunch of blowhards, but, since we were talking about is, is with regards to Nicaragua and, and all these other countries, like China, like you were saying, China, Russia is not allowed to invest in Central and South America. Only American corporations are allowed to do this. Is there any talk or discussions uh, of uh, in, within Nicaragua, seeing what's happening with El Salvador and the benefits of it? of like, hey, let's maybe start going with Bitcoin because we can then say, because Bitcoin is such a big, like later central banks and, and part of the problem of, of, of central banks is they use it as leverage. Like the IMF uses it. They used it against uh, Ecuador to make them give up Julian Assange. I mean, like the, the central banks fund all these wars. They're awful, not to mention all the sanctions that you, you've just been bringing up to us. So is there any talk or movement of Bitcoin coming to Nicaragua? Well, in Nicaragua, not yet. There is no discussion of it. But in Nick, in Venezuela, which has been under U.S. sanctions and a blockade for much longer, and is and is experimented, there is use of of certain cryptocurrencies. Now, I, I have to say honestly that a lot of people are very skeptical of Bitcoin. A lot of people think it's actually controlled by the CIA because no one knows who the there's like the Japanese name. I've forgotten the name it's of like the guy Tachi, who found yeah. it, but. But there, but for instance, Venezuela actually created its own cryptocurrency, which is called the Petro. And it's and the the value of the cryptocurrency, the Petro created by Venezuela, is tied to the price of a barrel of oil, which takes it off of the US dollar. It makes it a different like it, it, and and you can go to a store in Venezuela and you can buy something with Petro with the government created cryptocurrency. Now in you mentioned in El Salvador, the president Bukele has created this new policy. And, you know, I, I'm a little I, I think there's advantages, but there's also disadvantages. And to be honest, there are a lot of protests going on in El Salvador, especially with a lot of poor people who because if you have like a small business, you can't really I mean, we're talking about like really poor people like you often just can't you can't just use cryptocurrency. You want to actually have physical cash. But at the same time, one of the advantages of cryptocurrencies that you, you mentioned is that if you're under sanctions, it makes it way easier to do international business because what a lot of people don't realize is that almost all global finance, almost all rather global commerce, especially finance, but global commerce is done in US dollars. Although mm -hmm. in the past few years, that's been changing a lot, but especially in Latin America. I mean, what's crazy is people don't realize this. If, you're, if you work for the government of Ecuador, well, actually, Ecuador is a bad example because in Ecuador, the currency is literally the U.S. dollar, which is a sign of colonialism, right? They don't have their own sovereign currency. Let's say you're, you work for the government of Bolivia and you want to do trade with someone. You want to do trade with Chile. You both have your own independent currencies. But in order to trade with each other, you know, the Bolivian currency in Chile is worthless and the Chilean currency in Bolivia is worthless. So what you end up doing is you end up doing trade in dollars often. And if you're the government of, you know, you're the government of Iraq and you want to do trade with Turkey, you'll often do trade in dollars, which doesn't make sense because only one country in the world can print dollars, the U.S. And they do, they print a lot of them and they give them to banks and they give them to, to rich people and corporations for free. And with quantitative easing, I mean, it's just a free for all for all these big corporations that are already rich and all the shareholders, which are owned, you know, shares are, are owned by a tiny percentage of rich elites. So there are advantages, of course, in cryptocurrency. Another disadvantage, though, is that, you know, if you have a personal investment in Bitcoin, you can make a lot of money in the short term, right? But there's so much fluctuation that if you're a government and you're going to invest all this money and there's a massive fluctuation, it's not very stable yet, then it's, it's hard to make that decision. Although over time, cryptocurrency might start to stabilize more. And then, yes, definitely. A lot of people are talking about new ways to try to use cryptocurrencies to get around sanctions. So, you know, there's positives and negatives. I, I, I'm not going to lie and say that, like, 
you know, everyone is totally down with crypto. There are criticisms, mm -hmm. but at the same time, Venezuela and other countries in the region have been exploring ways to try to diversify their commerce and trying to do trade, not just in cryptocurrency, but also they're doing trade in the Chinese yuan and the Russian ruble. They're trying to do trade in other currencies because the US dollar is one of the main ways that Washington and Wall Street maintain their, their chokehold on mm -hmm. the international, not just political system, but the economic system. Because again, there's one country in the world that can print dollars, but much of the world has to use those dollars to do trade. So that what that means is that the US can help control the international economy and, the, and international trade. Well, yeah, and that's why we're so threatened by Russia and China because look, China said a couple of years ago, we're done with the petrodollar, we're using the petro yuan. Uh, Russia and China are doing are dealing with each other without using the petrodollar. Russia and about, I don't know, a half a dozen or so Central Asian countries agreed to stop, like you were talking about, like if if you know this country wants to do business with a, a neighboring country. So Russia about a year or so ago. I think it was beginning of 2020 said um all these countries you know Kazakhstan Pakistan all these countries that when they would trade they would have to do what you talked about they'd have to convert to dollars and they said we're no longer doing that so they, I mean they just took a whole region of the world and said we're not using the dollar anymore that's the real threat that's why America's like oh China Russia is so authoritarian it's like again we're America, when we talk about, and I'm not excusing any authoritarianism in China or Russia, but we have a lot of nerve. We're like a meth head with a face tattoo telling an alcoholic, you drink too much. Like we, we're, we have no, no business telling anybody what they should do with their authoritarianism as we have the most highly funded intelligence apparatus that spies on its own citizens of anywhere in the world. Even and way that controls than, the government. I mean, controls the government. I mean, like, I mean, the CIA is not independent. They control huge parts of the government. Look what they did. I mean, I hate Trump, but look what they did to Trump. They basically did an operation to destabilize the Democratic elected president. As awful as he was, he was elected. Yeah. Yeah. Because he did, he made the mistake of, of talking out loud of saying, no, we're just going to keep the troops here to protect the oil. They're <laughs> like, you can't say that. Say it's for democracy. What are you doing? <laughs> you can't tell people the truth. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's really interesting to see where we're at and um, and how this is going to play out uh, with not just Nicaragua, where you're at, but but the rest of of Central and South America specifically. So how okay, what, if, I, if, if I can jump in for a second on, on the sure. point of the, the, the petrodollar and dollar diplomacy, so-called dollar diplomacy, which is really a dollar dictatorship. We should keep in mind that I mentioned the war in Libya in 2011. This was a an Obama administration war. It's been largely swept under the rug, but. NATO with you know the military lines led by the US destroyed the most prosperous country in Africa Libya which again the crime of Libya the government of Libya was providing free healthcare and education and housing and all these programs to people and but not only that the president Muammar Gaddafi was also trying to create a an African currency for the continent of Africa yep. based not on the dollar but on gold he was trying to make a pan african gold based currency and that was one of the factors that was actually cited. We have documents from WikiLeaks, thanks to Julian Assange. That's why he's a political prisoner right now. We have documents from France, internal emails from France, in which they admitted that one of their goals was they wanted to prevent Gaddafi from creating a gold-backed pan-African currency. And they succeeded in not only killing Gaddafi, but also destroying the country of Libya, which, again, still has no central government 10 years later. Oh, I mean, if you want to get yourself assassinated, just say, I'm going to get off the petrodollar and then boom. I mean, Saddam said it. I mean, anyone who said that bye. I don't care if you, I mean, Saddam worked with the CIA in the eighties. So, I mean, yep. we hmm. backed him in the Iran Iraq war. So anyone time somebody says we're not using the petrodollar, you're done. You, you just, you just put a bullseye on your head. Like, because this is, but, but slowly these countries are starting to get out. And, and because they're seeing how the U S flexes its muscle. So, um, you know, uh, before we go here, uh, first of all, how long have you been living in Nicaragua and what made you decide to move down there? Yeah, I, I've only been living here for two years, but I decided to come down because in 2018, I mentioned there was this very violent coup attempt and 
immediately, you know, Nicaragua had been trying to lie low and there was not, there was always very critical media coverage, but it was trying to lie low and trying not to attract a lot of attention. But in 2018, there was tons of media propaganda, just demonizing Nicaragua constantly and constantly. So I came down to do reporting and to provide a new perspective. And I really liked it. I mean, I think it's important. I'm, I'm, I wanted to be here as a, as a U.S. journalist to English language speaking journalists to be able to report on what's happening on the ground. You know, I've gone to Venezuela multiple times and I've been throughout the region, Bolivia, Ecuador, Colombia. So, you know, as a journalist, I, I was already working a lot in Latin America, but I thought Nicaragua would be a good base because I knew after the, the failed coup attempt in 2018 that there was going to be a huge like operation, more and more media coverage, more and more sanctions and all of this. And I thought that like it would be a good time to be here and report on what's happening on the ground because you know there are a few journalists in venezuela that do really good work like the website venezuela analysis but there was really no one in english reporting very few on nicaragua and then also i'm not going to lie another major reason is it's beautiful there's tons of beaches and volcanoes and hiking the the weather is is all year round it's always like in the 80s which i mean it can be a little hot but it's never cold like so I'm not going to lie. I mean, it's I wanted to be here to report happening as a journalist. Also, it's a beautiful country. And there's a lot of people who come here as tourists because it's such a beautiful place. It's right next door to Costa Rica. So, like, you know, you might have heard of people going to Costa Rica on vacation. But Nicaragua is way better than Costa Rica. I've surfed Costa Rica. It was awesome. I'd come down there and surf. There's got to be badass surfing there. Yeah, I don't surf. But, but people say that Nicaragua has some of the best surf beaches in the world. Dude, well, maybe I'll come down there and they got they got fast internet, obviously. So like, yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> what city do you live in? In in the capital, Managua. All right. What's funny is you mentioned, I think you mentioned the Convo Couch people who have been doing really good coverage mm -hmm. of Nicaragua. And they, they just came down for the elections and they were observers with the international delegation. By the way, they're... There was one one media narrative, one media myth is that there were no international observers. There were 232 international observers from 27 countries that observed the elections here on November 7th. And, and there were three people from the Convo Couch, Pasta and a few others. And they were like, yeah, this place rules. We love it. It's beautiful. <laughs> so a lot of people come down. And they're like, man, this place is so beautiful. And, and the weather is great. And yeah, I mean, as a journalist... I just wanted to be here to, to, to show what's happening on the ground. And because, you know, there's if you're outside of a country, you can never have a certain kind of you can still report on it. There are good people outside of countries that do good reporting. But like when you're on the ground, it just helps give you that that whole new level of understanding. All right. I might come visit, man. Go surfing and, uh, you know, cover some news just to write the trip off. That sounds like great. That sounds like a great idea. You should. I mean, I always tell people this, but in all seriousness, like it's a great tourist location. And the people are nice and the cost of living is cheap. Like yeah. Central and South America, everyone's so nice. And another key point I didn't mention, another reason the Sandinistas are so popular. Nicaragua is the safest country in Central America by far. You mentioned El Salvador and there's been more tourism because of Bitcoin. Well, another, but a big problem with El Salvador is the violence, the gang violence. El Salvador, the violence has been slowly decreasing, which is good, but it's still one of the most dangerous countries in Latin America. It's very dangerous. There's a lot of violence because of all the gangs. Nicaragua, on the other hand, is one of the safest countries in Latin America. The murder rate in Nicaragua is lower than the U.S. murder rate. I mean, it's not saying a lot because the U.S. murder rate is actually pretty high, but yeah. Nicaragua is very safe compared to the region. Even It's even safer than Costa Rica, which is a common place for mm -hmm. tourists. So like, that's another advantage of coming to do tourism in, in Nicaragua is that it's very safe. There's very little violent crime. Do you get to use healthcare there? Yeah. Well, if you're a tourist, you have to pay for a visa, which is $20, which you pay at, at customs. If you're a U.S. citizen or a European citizen, you can just get a visa and you pay $20 in cash at the customs. And that gives you that gives you the right. You, you have a 90 day tourist visa and you can use healthcare while you're there for the 90 days. And if you have residency, I have residency, then yes, you can use healthcare. How did you get residency? Well, you did, like any country, it's like a green card. You just apply for residency like any country in the world. Okay. So yeah, you can, of course you can use education or you can use uh healthcare. 
Do they have digital nomad visas? I don't know what that is. What, what is that? Is a, that the, a digital nomad COVID? visa is a lot of countries are starting to do this now. People that work remotely, um, like you do, I do, uh, are inviting people to come work remotely and they'll give them these, each country is different, but like it's an incentive because they realize that if you work remotely and you come to whatever country, you're not You'll taking a local, local person's economy. job. Yeah. You're just, yeah, you're spreading money. You're, you're taking money you make on the internet and, and dumping it in that country. So, um, all right. I'm going to look into Nicaragua, man. You might be seeing me down there, dude. Like, uh, you should I, visit. I'm, I always tell people like, it's, it's cool, man. Like it, it's really beautiful. The weather is always, always nice. There's no winter. I mean, that was, I was living in New York and I just, I was so tired of how expensive it was. And also just the winter, man. I'm so, I, I'm, it's Christmas time here. Like there's like Christmas decorations up, you know, it's a Christian country or whatever. Like it's a cultural sure. thing, but it's so funny because right now it's like 82 or 83 degrees Fahrenheit, but it's like <laughs> Christmas. It's crazy. <laughs> I love that. I, I absolutely love that. I grew up in Chicago and I'm like, I'm I can't do cold winters anymore. I just can't oh, do God. it. Like even Chicago Southern California winters are too much. Cause I can't, I got to surf in a wetsuit. It's already too rough. It's already too bad. Um, well, Ben, tell everybody where they can follow your stuff. At the gray zone behind me, uh, let's cut off, but the gray zone.com gray with an A and you can find my reporting, Max Blumenthal, Aaron Mate. So yeah, cool. talk about Spanish. Yeah. The only thing is, you know, if you're in Latin America, obviously you got to learn Spanish. You can find a few people, but one being honest, very few people speak fluent English. So, okay. That's know. good to know, but it you'll, you'll learn quickly. My right. Spanish has improved a ton in the past several years. That's awesome. Well, Ben, I really appreciate you taking the time and thanks for, uh, you know, giving us all this great information about what uh, is happening in not just Nicaragua, but, but central, uh, and South America. So we really appreciate you coming on the show. We'll definitely have you back and, and maybe I'll come visit you down there. You should. Yeah. We can do some interviews down here, but, and thanks for having me, Graham. Keep you got up it, ben. The, Thank keep you. Up the great work. You got it, brother. You too, man. Hey everybody, thanks for watching. We are still in our like ninth month of demonetization from YouTube. So support what we're doing at patreon.com slash Graham Elwood or rockfin.com slash Graham Elwood, which is a blockchain cryptocurrency platform. It's free to sign up and there's a premium level at $10 a month. And for that, you get everybody on the platform's premium content. Myself, Lee Camp, Ron Placone, Jimmy Dore, Whitney Webb, Kim Iverson, Abby Martin, and many, many others. You can also support what we're doing at Venmo at Graham-Elwood and go to GrahamElwood.com. We have a PayPal button and a PO box. I also have crypto wallets, which are all in the show notes. Thanks for supporting what we do.